Hello, friends. Welcome. Welcome to all of our homes slash outdoor spaces. Really glad you guys are all here. We'll give you guys a minute to get settled, grab something to drink or a snack, get comfortable. And then we'll give you a couple tips and tricks and then um, get you started. Take a minute to digest a couple of these tips on the screen. Fairly self-explanatory. And if you received our pre-event email, most of these things were on there as well, but it'll just make the experience on Zoom a little smoother. Awesome. Welcome. So we'll get, just get started. Um, I'm Claire. I'm Atlantic's Director of Marketing, and we're so thrilled to have you all here with us today. Um, we're going to be together for about an hour. Um, Lloyd and Cleet will be speaking for about 45 minutes, and then we'll take some questions. If you have any questions along the way, uh, whether they be for Lloyd and Cleet or um, any technical questions that you have, feel free to use the Q&A. It's a little button at the bottom of your Zoom screen, um, and we'll do our best to answer it. Um, quickly and then what we'll do is we'll gather questions during the 45 minutes and then towards the end of our hour um, Annie will select a handful of questions depending on how much time we have and um, to be able to ask some of them to Lloyd and Cui directly. Um, other than that obviously this is a live Zoom event which means that we rely on the internet to keep things stable. There's only so much we can do with the internet. If anything goes funky along the way we'll take a quick pause make sure that things are efficiently taken care of and then you guys should be out of here by five o'clock eastern time. Um, and mostly, thank you so much for joining us um, on a Friday in the middle of this very strange summer that we're all having. Annie, I'll let you take it from here. Awesome. Thank you, Claire. Yeah. Um, so good afternoon. I'm Annie McRae. I'm Atlantic's Associate Artistic Director, and it's so um, wonderful to have you all with us this afternoon for another Live with Atlantic, which is our Friday virtual programming. And we're so excited because this is the first um, Writers Reflect, and I couldn't think of a better pair to kick it off. Uh, so we have Lloyd Sa and Kui Gwyn with us today. And um, we love these guys. They were the co-producers of Atlantic's Asian American Mix Fest in 2017. And we are also very lucky to have commissioned both of them. So each of them is on the hook to write a new play um, for Atlantic. So I will turn it over to these guys in just a minute, but before I do, I wanted to take this opportunity to say, while we're working really hard to get um, everyone back into a theater to experience live theater, which we obviously miss so much in these um, intervening moments while we wait, we are relying on the generosity of donors in part to keep us going. So if you've been enjoying these Friday uh, weekly series and if you have fun today, we would love it if you would consider making a contribution to the Atlantic and there will be a link in the chat for that. So thanks so much for considering that. And uh, I will kick it over to you, Lloyd and Kui, have fun. They're gonna just have a chat and uh, then we'll have some questions at then. So go for it, guys. Thanks, hey, Mr. Sa, how you doing? Good, how you doing? What, what do you, <laughs> you wanna talk about? Uh, I should mention, like, yeah, this is a little, it's a little, cause we, I guess we've talked a few times since uh, Stay at Home started. Um, and we used to do a fair amount of public speaking together. Usually, yeah. And we were usually at our best when we were totally unrehearsed, but it's probably been about a decade <laughs> since we've done it. <laughs> so maybe that is very will, true. Maybe this will go very well and maybe it won't. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess the biggest, a good place to start if you're cool with it is just um, in terms of uh, like how you're navigating the moment, how you're navigating like where you are right now, um, how it's affecting what you were working on, what you're thinking about now, and just what you're thinking about in terms of the future. Uh, yeah, I mean, like for, for myself, I think that, uh, I mean, I, I think like I'm, 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 I'm definitely one, I feel very lucky and fortunate that right now I have a uh, I have a job that uh, I get to keep working on. I'm, I'm writing a, a, a movie for Disney. And so we are uh, making a film uh, th via, you know, you know, social distance um, and just kind of figuring out how to do all that. Um, but, uh, but it's been, it's, it's, 
you know, it's, it, I feel like I have all of the issues that anyone else has from working from home. Like I, the, the advantages of getting to be home a little bit more and uh, having this extra time with my kids and my wife, I super appreciate the, I think the harder thing of it all is trying to work from home and your kids think, you know, when they see you right there, they're like, oh, I get to have your attention, but you're also like, you know, having, uh, you know, meetings about the, this thing and there's you know, <laughs> what they don't realize on the other side of the computer is like 26 individuals staring at me as I'm going, can you put on your, you know, thing. Uh, I really, I don't know if I'm allowed to swear right now. Uh, so <laughs> I'm just going to, you know, but I, you know, you also have to be a dad <laughs> at the same time. Um, so I, I think it's, it's both. How are you doing? What are you working on right what now, Mr. Suh? May I call you Lloyd? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should call me Lloyd. Uh, all right. No, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm in an interesting spot. I'm in a very different spot than I've, have, than I've been in in a very long time. Um, I don't have a job now, which in some ways is like amazing. And in some ways, like when I think about the future is a little unsettling. But it also, uh, it just feels like a right, uh, like a really valuable time for me to be able to take the time to um, process. And th there are things that I'm, like I went 10 years, you know, I was working 10 years at the LARC as director of artistic programs there, which was a, you know, pretty all consuming job. And it was really difficult for me to find these pockets of time to write or even to think about writing. So a lot of the stuff that I was doing was very impulsive. Um, uh, you know, a lot of it, I really, I really, I, you know, I liked, I, you know, I got used to the rhythm of being very impulsive and, um, kind of secreting away these blocks of hours where I had to write very quickly and write very uh, subconsciously almost. Like, um, but now I'm at a place where I think uh, I have a lot more time to reflect, mm -hmm. um, which feels right because we're in a moment where reflection seems kind of necessary. Um, I've been thinking a lot about this because, uh, yeah, I mean, I think there, you know, I, obviously everybody has good days and bad days. And on the good days, I feel, I feel really optimistic that the particular moment that we're in as a society is one that's, you know, gonna lead to lasting uh, palpable change. Uh, and then, well, like when I'm in my worst moments, I feel, oh, well, none of this matters. We're all going to die. <laughs> like it's, it's uh, the end isn't. The end. Uh, there's that nihilist I know so well. <laughs> and, then, and then, so, like, most of the time, I'm somewhere in between. And, you know, most days I, I vary between the two. So, it's just a question of just trying to, like, capitalize on those positive moments and trying to navigate the, the, the negative ones, I guess. Yeah. I think, I think what's interesting right now, well, I. It's, what's interesting about you and me, Lloyd, is the fact that out of almost any other writer I know, like I've been friends with you since the literally the beginning of our careers to this point, right? Like uh, we've, you know, like I, I, I was interviewed a couple of years ago and they, someone asked me who my three favorite writers were. And, you know, I did the typical like David Henry Wong being an Asian American writer. It's hard not to be in his shadow. And so, so in some ways I, I'm a reaction to his work and sometimes I'm inspired by his work, but I think he's a very important person. The other person means even Natalie Gerges because he was like the first professional writer that really showed me what like, the, like I just love the authenticity of New York that he, he portrayed. And the third person was you. Uh, oh, like great. when it comes to the most influential people. Uh, and it's, it, was, it, it was because like out of almost anyone in my career, I've never, you were like, one of my first friends in this industry and I so admired your work, but it felt like we artistically almost started at different points of, uh, art, you know, at different kind of aesthetics. We yeah. then kind of crisscrossed each other's aesthetic. Uh, and I'm just to use examples, like when we started, you had written plays like American Long Op and Children of Bonderly, which were uh, these incredible stories, but they were really about these very well crafted and created characters and their intricate stories. And they were like, for all intents and purposes, really well-made plays. While I was writing things about like vampires and zombies that weren't necessarily the deepest stories in the world, but they played with form and content and, and theatricality. And then you fast forward to you know, like 15 years and I'm starting to do some very kind of soul searching work like you were doing with like Bit Gone, Poor Yellow Rednecks. And then to look at some of your, your most recent work like Chinese Lady and your Charlie Chan plays, they're super theatrical, still very emotional, very moving. Like that last monologue in your Charlie Chan play brought me to tears and it broke all sorts of forms and, and, and theatrical convention. And so I'm, I'm now I'm kind of interesting, like what happens, like how is this moment in time 
uh, evolving you beyond just, you know, what was the next step? Because like, I think in, our, in any artistic career or lifespan, we find different missions, different inspirations that drive us in different, uh, in different pathways. And like, this is definitely a thing that we as an entire industry will be reacting to or being influenced by. And I'm, I, and I'm, I'm excited to see what, uh, what happens with your career because you've always been a huge inspiration of mine because without a doubt seeing those early plays um, inspired me to become more self-reflective and I'm, I'm excited to see what those next things are. But is there any particular stories uh, that you're really kind of, kind of examining right now? Yeah, there are. And I'm going to answer that question, but I'm also going to address some of the thing, other stuff that you said just about yourself in relation to me. I'm going to do, but I'll do that after because I, <laughs> okay. I have a lot of thoughts about that. But I think uh, like the, um, to the second part of the question, uh, like in terms of what I'm working on, like what I was working on before and what I've been working on for like really like several years before, like over the past five years or so, like around the time of that Charlie Chan play was really this deep investigation into Asian American history, like hidden pockets of Asian American history. Um, and a lot of that is because I, um, you know, when I was doing that Charlie Chan play, uh, like I, I went into this deep dive into history because it's about stereotyping. It's about like what the, um, what the, what iconography exists, like what the, what the symbolism and representation of Asian America was prior to the creation of like an Asian American political and social identity. So doing that research uncovers like a lot of pretty bleak stuff, a lot of really um, kind of humiliating, like really shameful periods in history, um, which are not really fun to read about or to dwell on or to think about too much. But what ultimately really made me feel like I needed to grapple with it, I needed to wrestle with it somehow. So the Chinese lady came out of that as a direct result of like research that came out of that process. Um, the new uh, the play that I'm working on under commission with Atlantic um, uh, called Exclusion, which is uh, like around the experience of Angel Island um, and the legacy of the Chinese Exclusion Act is really around that as well. Just like this kind of wrestling with um, Asian American history in part because, you know, and all of it coincides, you know, like I'm not that self-aware, but I can't, I'm also not, uh, not, uh, not so unself-aware to recognize that a lot of this just has to do with, um, you know, having children, like looking at, like thinking about legacy, thinking about what, uh, relations of generations, like uh, the difference in the way my children are being raised, the way I was raised, to the way that my parents who were you know, uh, immigrant, who were immigrants to this country were raised, and just thinking about like, what is carried on? What is understood? Why didn't I know those stories? Why doesn't anybody know those stories? Why is that? Why is Asian American history not part of American history? All that stuff. So um, that's what I had been grappling with before. And then once, um, you know, once once all of this happened, once I mean the phases of it, right? Like you have you have a quarantine. You have the uh, the recognition of what's going on. You have, you know, like a president calling it Kung Fu and Wuhan virus. And I, I started to think about like, what, okay, like theaters are shut down. It's going to be a while. How do I approach like this play that I, you know, had a first draft of about the exclusion of Chinese in America, about the legacy of exclusion of Chinese in America, when we're also dealing with, okay, like when theaters do come back, what, are the, what, is the, what is the narrative going to be around China, around immigration, around like migration? Um, I'm just thinking, okay, I don't know. So I have to put that aside for a little while. <laughs> I have to like, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I know what it, you know, like, I, but, I'm, but I'm also aware of what, I, what I'm dealing with around it emotionally. What I need from that story and what I'm like, what I'm hoping it can do in the world. Um, and how that's changing. And then I also think about um, like the, uh, what is the relationship of that with um, the part of the, the part of um, what's going on in the world right now that's really about a reckoning with history. It's really about a reckoning with um, uh, a legacy of racism, a legacy of white supremacy and patriarchy in this country. And when we reckon with that, and when we're navigating like, you know, what do we do about history? How do we assess the way history has been taught? 
How do we rethink the way history was thought, taught? How do we rethink just what history, uh, how, how we relate to history now? All of that is just like really fresh and very raw in my mind. So those are the things I'm thinking about. I don't have any answers. Um, right. But those, that's the stuff that's uh, just making my brain go in a whirl. And ultimately, I think probably making me a little, uh, a little um, hesitant to try and uh, write anything that has like a thesis or a point to it. If I do any writing, it's more investigative. <laughs> any pointed invective. But the thing I'll say about your writing, Kui, and what you described your narrative, I, you know, I really appreciate all the things you, you said, some very nice things, but uh, the other thing I'll say about that is, I don't think, you know, I don't know, maybe you're, maybe you're more self-aware than me, maybe you're less self-aware than me, but I think, and we've talked about this before, uh, but now that we're talking about it publicly, I'll, I'll say it more directly, which is that um, I think that when I first met you, I, I don't agree that you weren't doing a kind of introspective personal searching. I think that Vampire Cowboys was, um, like even the silliest versions of your Vampire Cowboys plays were about an investigation into um, some part of, uh, you know, I mean, all of this stuff, uh, comic book aesthetic, uh, geek theater, like those things, it's, it's grappling with, um, what I know are the big markers of your growing up, right? Um, yeah. I mean, you call it, it's, you call it VC, which you can't, you know, is it an accident? <laughs> it's like, it's, 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 oh, no, it's not an accident you know, at all. Yeah. It's a guy creating a theater company called VC. And then you have, um, like, around that same time, you've written Travel by Water. And you've written, and I know, like, right. between Travel by Water and HEG and, um, and uh, even ultimately to Viet Gone, like that you've been spending a lot of time, like probably since the first, when I first met you, that you had been uh, circling the same, like a, uh, uh, the same um, personal history. Like you've been navigating a family history um, from various different ways and various different aesthetics. And so I guess my question there is, um, like, just through all of that, I'm curious what you've learned, um, not just about that history, but just about your own craft as a writer, your own process as a writer, and the way you Yeah, think. I mean, I, when I first started, like, I think that I, you know, I always had that feeling that um, whenever I had to, when I, when I tried to write Trial by Water, the first attempt to write any of my family's story, I think I always felt like I had to treat it with some sort of reverence, uh, I had to be a lot more mature than I am. So I always was trying to reach into becoming a writer that I was never going to be. And then somewhere along the way, I, you know, I think it was actually Agent G. Um, when I, you know, it was, I was writing that play. It was the third play in that, that trilogy of things. And I was super frustrated. I just couldn't get into that headspace. This was like maybe after eight years of doing Vampire Cowboys work. And Abby, my wife, uh, said you know why don't you just make it a vampire cowboys play and i was like that sounds stupid i am not that would never work and so i was like okay i will write that version really super fast and you're gonna see how terrible that is and it ended up being my probably my favorite vampire cowboy play we ever did uh but it it, it touched upon all those things and so that eventually evolved into becoming uh vidgon and, and poor yellow rednecks the, the plays that i'm currently writing in the third play that that I'm currently working on when it comes to that stuff. Uh, but I think that the, the thing that like, you know, that I, I keep thinking about right now in this moment uh, when it comes to like that kind of work uh, and it's something, it's, it's because I think I'm also working in Hollywood right now and just seeing what work is out there and the, the work that is quote unquote, you know, the, the Asian leaning work that's there. And it all feels for all intents and purposes kind of the same. Um, meaning, you know, if I start to name them, like even from Crazy Rich Asians to Mulan to Shang Chi coming up, they all they're they're all like great, you know, movies, big budget studio films uh, that that celebrate Asian artists. But those Asian artists always are, are over there. You know, we're always in Singapore, we're in China, we're never 
we rarely get to, I, I rarely get to see my history of being an Asian American here. You know, like I think Asians are often depicted as rich, foreign, and kind of model minorities. And I was not rich. I was a poor kid. Uh, I grew up here and I was probably the farthest thing you could ever consider a model minority. And so it was just like, I, I desperately wanted to, I still want to see that. I think that that's the thing that I still love about theater because I think, which is a hard thing right now is the thing that I loved about theater is to, for me, it's the most immediate art out of the three things, television, film, and, and theater. Uh, Cause I can think up an idea now and literally a month from now, a show could be made. Like I, it, it's, you know, with Vampire Cowboys, we concocted it in October and it came up in, you know, March or April. It was months before it came up. Uh, and it was something that I really love about theater. That immediate, like I have a reaction or I'm, 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 I'm exploring something and suddenly it gets to be a thing. Uh, and right now I'm having to do a thing that I haven't done as a playwright in a long time, which is just like sit on some ideas and watch them evolve and simmer and grow. And I don't know if I'm that kind of writer. So it may all come out as junk on the other end. That's overthought, overworked, and like a piece of like, uh, you know, meat that's been over like needed. It may end up tasting terrible. But I think that that is something I'm kind of doing for the first time and kind of letting some ideas uh, simmer and grow. Uh, for the first time, and it's it's a weird, weird, um, it's a weird situation to be in. Uh, I also know that there are other forms uh, that you know artists are using to to deal with this this moment in time with Zoom theater and web theater. Um, our, our our loving you know home base in in New York and Mai Yi is is starting a studio there, and they're going to start doing some more web based uh, stuff, and. Um, it's an interesting thing, right? And and I've always been a person who, whenever I see a challenge, I always want to lean into it. And I'm like, oh, that that could be very exciting. It could also be a nightmare. <laughs> who knows? Uh, how, how, what's your relationship with that stuff? That's, yeah, my, I mean, my first reaction was being like, no, I don't want to do that. And I think mostly it's because I don't like, uh, you know, my, my impulse is always that form follows function, that I don't like to lead with form. I don't like to be like, oh, I have to do it this way, so let's come up with something to fit that model. And then the more I started to think about it, I did have, like, as I was talking to Ralph, like, he was telling me what he had in mind, and, like, as he was talking, I was like, wait, I have an idea. <laughs> and uh, an idea sort of, and it's the very beginnings of an idea, but it's something that I'm, I'm curious about exploring, which is like a, a story and a thing that I've been grappling with before that seem to feel like, oh wait, this is about, um, I mean, I don't, I, I don't wanna give, I don't wanna say too much in case it doesn't turn into a thing, but it's kind <laughs> of about like the, the concept of virtual utopia. <laughs> like what is a future digital virtual utopia look like? And it felt like a, uh, a worthy exercise to at least do something short form around, uh, like first draft of a virtual utopia. <laughs> but anyway, but anyway, uh, speaking of that, uh, like before we got, I was I was talking to Jeannie, my wife Jeannie, and uh, I said, "Hey, I gotta do this interview with Queen. Is there anything you think I should ask him?" She said, oh, oh, "Oh, ask him about Sam Samurai." And I was like, oh, "What is it? What is it?" Because I'm not, I don't, I, I don't have social media anymore. But she showed me the clips you've been doing of Sam Samurai. And I think that, that 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 is, it's related exactly to the impulse to create, like out of yeah. what you have a bit, you know, like, and probably exercising muscles that that you're worried about atrophying while you're sitting. <laughs> right, right. Uh, in, yeah. in case anyone's watching and oh, no, wondering what different. the hell that we're talking about, uh, I, I made these series of like short action and action movies with my kids where they're literally trying to kill each other with swords and it's a it's an opportunity for me to choreograph fights <laughs> and it's and having my kids play with it um i mean th to be honest like that i think that like with like a lot of us like those first couple of weeks in quarantine um i thought i was gonna be super dead right like i was teaching the martial arts i was i was I, I was really enjoying like making these short movies with them i was being super creative i was like this i this is who i'm gonna be 
fast forward three months, I have not made any movies with them. I, like we've stopped doing martial arts together. I'm just trying to like make it through a day without them eating me. Uh, and so like, I think it was like grand ambition at that point. I mean, my kids still want to make movies, but now they don't want to make them with me anymore. They're making uh, short movies with Beanie Boos and things like that. And I'm always like, hey, you want to, like, I, and I went overboard. I bought new swords. I bought new like stage Oh, knives wow. i i was prepped to do that i had built them costumes and they were like no we kind of want to make a thing about you know stuffed animals uh scaring you i was like sweet sweet that's cool cool thanks for being your own individual person <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah you you prefer to be able to teach them the 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 Violence, right? <laughs> exactly. Well, it's a, it's a thing. I think I think I finally, you know, as a kid, I remember like my dad trying to teach me uh, stuff, and then like I just and he got so frustrated with me. It's, it's like if you want to learn this, you learn from someone else, and that's what I ended up doing. And I, I I was like, wow, my dad's such an asshole. And now as a dad myself, I find myself doing the same thing. It's like, okay, this is how you throw a jab. This is you know you know followed by a cross and then I put up the mitts and they're just like bah, 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 bah. like they're doing whatever they want to and I'm like okay if you ever want to learn this you're, we're just gonna put you to school like I say I'm literally saying the exact same words that my dad are saying uh but minus um the accent uh so yeah uh but, by the way I I had like a really fucking dumb idea uh like I was gonna call you last I was like well we start this Lord we should both start with accents and then slowly as this interview goes it should slowly <laughs> meld away oh, as if speaking at the Atlantic somehow like completely <laughs> made us different people but then I, I forgot to do it and also I can't do accents worth of shit <laughs> so yeah no that would that never would, cause I you to would, do it I think that would have drastically passed out um <laughs> <laughs> well, it would have been a little bit like just us trying to prank or do something. It sounds a little bit more well, like we also can't, <laughs> like right like now that, we're being very mature in our our questions with each other. But I, you know, which I think <laughs> the Atlantic Chris probably appreciating because I'm sure that there's some student watching this going, I have something to take from this, <laughs> whereas I would have just spent an hour making pranks. Um, oh, luckily, yeah. I, I, mean, I, I was lazy because <laughs> we like we can't gauge how 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 we're doing right? <laughs> not at all there's, <laughs> there's not even like hand claps you know, or anything I, in there. I know that there are people watching but i can't i don't know what they're if, uh, <laughs> uh so yeah maybe if we tried to open it with a gag uh i don't think it, it would might have be. like exploded in our faces um We'd have another six minutes so, just sitting there speaking, uh, someone just popped up said you're the best <laughs> you know, thank you for the foster for you oh yeah hey, we got a um i don't i'm i'm okay uh but you know what uh, speaking of like our pranks uh or our stunts like one of the things that i think was an interesting kind of evolution uh because at a certain point uh as, with our friendship we ended up running the mighty riders lab together um and we we kind of got to uh you know with that community of playwrights um you know the largest group of resident asian american playwrights in the universe um we were able to create like basically stunts we dared each other uh and pushed each other in different ways uh what were your some of you know like what like how were those dares and how were those kind of stunts that we did uh kind of push you and involve you as an artist look at me being super oh. serious I mean, the stunts themselves, like on a, on a formal or a craft level, I, I can't remember learning anything about them. But I, think that, but I think that the great, like what was great about them when they were community exercises, they felt like yeah. opportunities to, um, to just feel like you're part of an ecology of other writers doing something that, where like, where they're everybody's doing something different but you're all doing it together you know what i mean so that your individual voice feels honored and seen but you also feel like you're a part of something i remember we used to have these jokes where we wanted to we wanted like after meetings we and we tried a few different bars like maybe a handful of different bars where we wanted to like uh after the meetings have a bar where we would go to where the second we walked in as a group like everybody would go Oh no! <laughs> like in the whole time, <laughs> like, the, like the bartender would duck behind the bar, and people would kind of turn around. It's like, oh shit, the Mayu writers. <laughs> but that would be really. That was kind of the goal. Yeah, I just realized when I brought up the studs, I was actually leaning towards a specific 
piece that I was thinking of yours, I realized it wasn't one of our stunts. It was uh, it was actually something for Vampire Cowboys that you had done for us, where you had made one of our actress friends, Maureen Sebastian, oh, yes. eat an entire cheesecake within yeah. five minutes on stage, which was both one of the most hysterical and like disgusting things I'd ever seen in my life. You know? Well, the problem with that is, is and she that stayed your friend. She stayed your friend after that, which is unbelievable. And well, it's it, it, was a, it was a thing that built on itself, uh, kind of on accident. I had because the very first time I wrote for a revamp, that's what it was called, right? Revamp. Yeah, it was called a revamp. Yeah. Was, uh, was Maureen and Will Harper, and Will. This was not part of the play. Will just decided because he was drinking a 40 <laughs> as, as a prop, and he had a real 40, and he just decided, I'm going to drink this whole 40 by the end of the play. It's a 10-minute play. He's like, at the end of the play, I'm going to finish this 40. And he did it, and it was amazing. It was like, it was like the greatest theater you'd ever seen, because it's like this actor setting a, a non-thematic dare for himself across <laughs> the play. And so when I had to write a second revamp, I thought, there's no way I can top it unless somebody consumes <laughs> the course of the play. So that's, I mean, that's a, uh, I mean. Well, the interesting part of it was, it was like all during the monologue that Graham Gillis was doing about right. basically being the Terminator. And yeah. it was really interesting because Maureen had a very specific amount of time to eat this cheesecake. And I noticed like when she started, she was eating it at a normal rate. But as we got near to the end of his, her oh, yeah. monolo his monologue, she had to start just really shut. eating this thing really quickly to a point that made me feel uncomfortable because you know she had the big chipmunk teachers shoving down cheesecake and it was real and then you know when it was done i it was it was an incredible thing and if anyone who doesn't know maureen she is like basically a stick figure of a human being <laughs> so to watch her consume this was pretty incredible <laughs> I'm sure um, nobody wanted to hear the story, but I. Well, no, I think somewhere. you know, like uh, you know, like when when you started the story, I, you know, you had to admit a part of me was like, why are we? Doing this? <laughs> <laughs> but no, I do think I do think I mean, there's something telling about the fact that uh, you know, uh, you know, we've talked a few times, but here we are talking on digitally on uh, with unseen people, like you can't see the people that are watching this. I don't know who's on it, but. The fact that you're that this is what we're talking about is it does speak to um, uh, like we did some community based like you've done some extraordinary work in your career <laughs> you've worked up some of the most significant stages in the world and mm -hmm. uh, the but your face lights up when you talk about these things we did fifteen years ago in like these tiny spaces with your friends right. And I think yeah. that there's a, I think especially when we're in a moment right now when we're, when we're looking at what, what is the, you know, what is theater, what is theater going to be? What yeah. are, what are we in relation to history? What is the function of art? What is the, what is the function of community? What is the, what is the uh, feasibility of gathering and sharing space with other people? And the fact that, um, it brings up, you know, this stuff. Uh, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's beautiful. <laughs> it's really beautiful. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I completely agree. Like, I think that the inherently, you know, I always say that inherently theater is community theater. It's, even when you're at like the biggest, like, you know, several thousand seat venue, you're still ultimately doing a show for that city, that group, the people that can literally show up uh, you know, physically there, and usually they're a part of the same city, the same town, the same region, so it is part of a community that tends to know each other, and it's always interesting as a playwright to come into someone's house. Like, I think that that's the difference between, like, uh, what I was doing with Vampire Cowboys and what we were doing with my E versus what I, you know, my, my career has kind of, like, moved towards, where I'm kind of co being invited into other people's theaters, and it's their community, so it's, it, I'm getting invited in, but with Mayi with Vampire Cowboys. What was so great about it was it was a community that we developed, right? It was, it, you, when you came in, you're coming into my house. Like right. these people that are watching, they're part of that community. And I think the reason why I cherish it so much is because that was my family. Like, and when I say my family, I mean the thousands of people that came to see my shows and to see Vampire Cowboys shows. Those were our family members. We got to know them after seeing show after show. 
uh, after years and years of doing it, I, I, I knew their faces and I was able to have conversations with them and have the ability to talk about the play that I did last versus the one I'm doing now and them daring me to do the next thing, right? Like some mm -hmm. of our, our ideas for our stunts came from our audience. Some of the plays that I wrote came from them going, hey, have you thought about doing like a Shakespeare zombie play? Like they literally gave me the ideas often that would propel me into the next thing. And I think that that's kind of the difference between then and now, but I do cherish those moments. I think that that's a, a big thing of what I love about uh, our friendship has been like, and I, I cherish it because like, I've been able to witness your evolution, but I also notice, I, I know for myself personally, how my art has improved or grown because of my influence and my friendship with you. Even the times when you're not trying to be deep and you make jokes, uh, like I remember so distinctly in one of the My e Writers Lab, someone asking a very simple question and you said this, you threw it off as a joke. And they're like, how, you know, what if my scene is too short? And you made a joke like, no scene can be too short, but any scene can be too long. And I was like, right. And it has stuck with me ever since that like saying one too many words can like bore the shit out of my audience. But, you know, like it, if it's a little too short, it makes them kind of want more. And, and you almost rather have, oh, I could have seen a little bit more of that versus, oh, you spent way too much time there. Like, because you don't want anyone's eyes to close. Think small little things that you said as jokes have found their way into my eyes. And as much as I like to joke about it, uh, there was a long going joke for like almost 10 years in my E that Lloyd uh, was a long talker. No, <laughs> you were a long talker. <laughs> no, you're the long talker. No, you. Let's no, be clear. Talker. Uh, no, that, no, don't no. even start with that. No, and if we pulled the group, they would say Lloyd Suh's <laughs> the long talker. But I would say that long talking, that Lloyd Suh long talking character has appeared in many of my plays. And I go, hmm, if I had Lloyd Suh in this play and he had to long talk a monologue, what would Lloyd Suh say? And I think some of your DNA as my friend has shown up in many of my plays. Now that you mention it. there's a monologue, <laughs> that is a Lloyd Suh attribute. Well, now that you mention it, there's a question I've been meaning to ask. I think I've asked you this before and you didn't really answer it. Which is like, uh, you put my name and my wife's name and my daughter's name in your place, right? All the time, yeah. <laughs> and so uh, there is, you know, there is a, um, you know, I, like, like, you know, I don't know like, what's, what's going on there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 I tend to homage my friends. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm terrible at making up names. But didn't, and to didn't, be quite. Did, does, the, does the character name me, does he? Am I right? Does he just die? <laughs> <laughs> Wh which play? Well, I put Lloyd in a couple of my no, plays, by the way. No. <laughs> okay. so you're saying, like, I don't know which play you're speaking of exactly. Well, I did, because I did, you know, in that kids play that I wrote, The Long Kids, I did, uh, you know, knowing, I think it was right <laughs> after you had write, written, uh, uh, he kills monsters. Yeah, with the character Tilly, right after my daughter was born, and <laughs> after Tilly, that I uh, that I wrote uh, the, this character Queenwin, who I had written as like this uh, really helpful, really badass, really hilarious dragon, um, with a Scottish who, accent. Both the kids. Well, that was that ended up being a choice. Oh, that, that came later. Right. But also, I didn't put this into the the text. Uh, it just came up naturally in the production which is that he he dies <laughs> but <it's, laughs> yeah that's right you do kill no, the person you know, who kill but i win the dragon i, do I didn't the i didn't kill him in the text it just kind of happened naturally between <laughs> the the in the rehearsal ralph and room, yourself yeah and, ralph absolutely. And, and the actors that it, <laughs> it kind of happened you had to murder quigwit i get it i get it. i hear you oh and david valentine the pup the the <laughs> the puppet designer who who I met through you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so uh <laughs> have we gone yeah, off but I, I I I I but basically I put your, your names into my scripts or my friends' names into my scripts because I'm terrible at thinking up names. And I think honestly, I'm not really great at thinking up characters. So if I can think of characters like like if I put like like Will in the uh -huh. role like I can then just like uh, I can be able to just kind of like where well, I'm going to write Will into my play, and so now and then I'll change it later. But that's why I'm, it's, uh, something's popped up. It says I'm going to look at this Q. Is that a Q and A? What does it say? Oh, you know. Oh, are we? How do you show you? through your writing? 
Wait, someone's talking oh, to me. Don't what worry. Happened? It's Annie. Don't worry about those. Yeah, I'm going to pick them. So you guys just focus on being perfect and chatting for five more minutes, and then I'll pick the questions for you. You don't have to be distracted from your magical conversation. I enjoy the God voice that just appeared <laughs> out of nowhere to tell us, stop, don't, don't look at things. <laughs> so. Um, five minutes. What do you, what do you want to talk about? <laughs> I love that it's kind of like drowned out. We were like going a, a good clip and suddenly it's like, it's all witness shit. <laughs> we totally messed it up. Uh, I also realized that I started out trying to be clean and I just gave that up too because I'm terrible at it. Um, so uh, that that is basically you and I in a nutshell. <laughs> I think that I, I'm not the person you bring to parties <laughs> and, and family functions. <laughs> so you're, you're all right too. You're all right. You're all right. Um, um, did I have another interesting question for you? <laughs> uh, let me think. Oh, what? Oh, right. The oh, right, whole what? point we're talking about this is the because we did like our relationship with Atlantic, and the reason we're doing this, like uh, uh, the introduction was about Mixfest too, right? So maybe we should talk about Mixfest. Um, that was a few like sure, three, yeah, yeah, let's do that. Let's do it. That, that happened a bit, right. minute ago, right? Yeah. And I think that that was a similar thing, just in terms of its um, its focus on community as a uh, as a uh, just a way to gather folks and to share space with people in a way where different people are working on different projects in various different stages, all different kinds of things, um, getting writers, directors, actors, and everybody together in a space to yeah to share space and. Um, yeah. And hang out. And for us, it was also like, you know, a celebration of our friends, totally. the writers, and the work that they had that had, hadn't been produced yet, that we knew about, that we wanted people to know about. Uh, you know, it's, it's like, you know, it, we're the, like as many plays that you and I have produced, we have s several that are just sitting in our drawers that we know of each other's work. And that was the same thing that when we came to like some incredible playwright friends of ours that we just wanted to highlight. And I think that that was something, you know, I, I always go like, there's, you know, there's like two ways to climb a mountain, either alone or, you know, with your friends. And it's so much more fun to do it with your friends because then we should get to celebrate as a group, as a party when you get to the top. And it's always been important that I think for both of us that it's not just our own successes that, that, that we're, we're working towards, but trying to elevate our entire community. Uh, all those writers from IE, all those writers that uh, we know and are influenced by to just try to get them seen and recognized and to get their great plays produced out there because I, I don't think uh, I, I just think the more work out there that that represents uh, people that look like us just allows for more work for more people to get fed for more influ positive influences to the community you know I, I was watching that that uh, documentary disclosure and there, there's a very important comment in it and it was um, someone say you know saying that you can't be what you can't see and I think what's so important that, you know, what you and I keep doing for, you know, our, our Asian uh, collaborators and, and, and peers is trying to make sure that our actor friends and more importantly, our kids have representation on that stage uh, that they can, that they, ha that they have heroes that they can aspire to or people that can challenge them. And I think that that has always been integral to the work that we do. Uh, Vampire Cowboys has definitely had you know, I, I do with Asian work and, and all different kinds of characters, but I think at the heartbeat, I think uh, we're all trying to, to create positive characters that um, will do that. And I think that that was something that was important to me, still is important to me when it comes to the mission of Mixed Fest uh, when it first started and a mission that's still important to me now, even without a festival uh, to be around, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, there's ah. Annie. I decided to not just be a creepy god bike um, as much as I did <laughs> like that. Uh, you guys are amazing. I love every single thing that you're saying, especially about being parents in this time and everything um, that you're navigating in your amazing ways. Um, so these are great questions. I'm gonna pick just a few. Um, so for each of you, who is a young writer that each of you loves and wishes to bring to greater attention? What does young mean? No, you know what? <laughs> it's a very it, it, good. Like, I think I, like, I, I ask myself queen, every day. We is still <laughs> young. <laughs> I'm the exact same age as Lloyd. Lloyd is also still young. 
<laughs> you could say like emerging, I guess, or just broadly, yeah. Somebody who broadly, people might I mean, not have heard of yet. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the Mai Writers Lab, like that community and just folks that I've known through uh, my relationships with the Lark, like, um, uh, like I've had the opportunity to uh, work with some really extraordinary young writers. Um, and I'll use the word young very broadly, but he, you know, even especially like just thinking about uh, recent fellows through the New Voices Van Leer Fellowship Program at the Lark, uh, writers like uh, Donnie Love, C.A. Johnson, um, uh, Christina Quintana, uh, Brittany K. Allen, uh, Ife Alajobi, David Zhang, uh, Zhang, Eric Dickerson Dispenza, um, just really, really extraordinary writers. Um, and uh, 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 Xavier Galva um, doing things that I could never imagine doing at that age. Uh, it's really exciting um, just knowing like what's going on in theatrical expression, um, but also in uh, like how a lot of young writers are relating to some of these questions that Queen and I have been talking about around community. Um, what their work is doing in the world, um, but also even thinking about just like the state of theater today, like, I'm, you know, I don't want to keep like creating this uh, uncertainty around what this moment means, but just thinking about like, who are these plays for? What are this, what's, what are the state, like, how are we uh, disseminating this work? Um, and uh, who, who and how are they seen? Um, and how does that affect the way that they're, they're going to be written in the future? I think that's a really big, big, big thing. Awesome, thank you. Um, Kui, do you have anything to add or you want the next one? You're good. I'll go with the next one. I, I feel weird trying to name a specific name or anything yeah. like that because I feel that I leave out like so many you'd other get, young writers. Yeah, you'd have people or, knocking on your door and being mad. Yeah, well, also I, you'd I feel, have I feel to bad. name the same amount as Lloyd, which would be hard. You know, you gotta. Well, I, I got. I should be clear. Well, I mean, I've been I, 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 in a specific program so that I could blame the program structure. So there are a bunch of other writers and other like that I worked with through other programs, but, but, but no, I so. You're all good, you're Just good. Just to let you know, my, my kid is literally shooting me with a squirt gun as I'm doing this interview, so I'm sorry if I suddenly no. have to, have to like, chase perfect. him off. <laughs> you're great. Um, okay, so for emerging Asian American writers and actors, what advice do you have for getting started? I'm gonna keep leaving that to Lloyd. He's so, he's so much more of a grown up than me. Lloyd, what is your advice? Oh God! I mean, I, I uh, so um, I'll tell you what. This is this is a hard question because when I when I first moved to New York, there was a there was a groundswell of a lot of different kind of community based activity going on. Like the first one of the first things I did was I auditioned for like a reading of a play um, that somebody had posted for in backstage, and uh, I got cast in a small part in this reading. Um, of a play called Karaoke Stories by Ujin Kim. And there was a like, cast of like 20 people. <laughs> and so I walked in this room and suddenly I knew 20 Asian American theater artists. Um, uh, and that was through an organization called Second Generation that at that time was doing a lot of just like community-based programming. A lot of stuff focused on early career artists. And I benefited greatly from that stuff. In 2004, no, 2003, Sun now started the Money Writers Lab focused on creating community space. Like there was, there was programming specifically focused on this. Um, and I benefited a great deal from that. And as you know, the artistic director of second generation for a while from 2005 to 2010 and as the co-director of the Mighty Rangers Lab, I tried really hard to create similar spaces. Like uh, at 2G, we tried to have an open call every couple of years or every three or four years, we do an open call. Um, just so that there was an opportunity to capture that. Um, you know, as I've gotten older, I don't have the ability to do that anymore. I don't have that, that, uh, that energy or that, um, uh, that capacity. Um, but I will say that when I was, when I was doing that stuff, 
like you know it was you know i did a i did a lot of like a lot of extremely hard work for free very <laughs> work for free um and although i can't do that given the realities of my life i think that if if any of you are in a position where you can just organize just do that stuff just gather a bunch of people work on stuff and when you work on the hard things the really difficult time consuming hard things with people who are uh excited to do that too then they're going to become your friends forever. You're going to find a community that you can go to war with and collaborate with. Um, and even, you know, because it's so hard, you're going to look back and remember that stuff really fondly. Like I think about the history of Asian American theater. I think about what Kui did. He started his own company, he started Vampire Cowboys. Um, every one of these companies that you've heard of was started by one artist who wasn't getting an opportunity. Young Jing Lee started her own company. Um, uh, Haruna Lee started their own company. Um, uh, Ma Yi, Natco, East West, Asian Marie, like Move, all of them were created by artists who were like, I'm, I can't get a job. I need to find a community. And they created one. I don't think that that means you should start, like everybody should start their own company. But I do, what I do mean is that uh, there are opportunities for you to or there is value in uh, grassroots, um, just uh, DIY, you know, creating stuff on your own kind of thing. Um, yeah, I mean, if I were to piggyback on that at all, I'm not. I, I don't know if I have a lot of advice to give, but I think that I, I would go. Well, if it makes you feel any better, uh, being a young artist, I think that like when you look at me and Lloyd, or, or you can just look at me specifically, like. Uh, like I, 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 if I always feel like if I could do this, if I can find find a way to have a career, I think almost anyone can. Because uh, if you look on paper, like I was, uh, you know, a, a kid who, you know, grew up in the small town in Arkansas. I had, I have no connections to this industry. I went to like basically schools that weren't fancy. Uh, I came from a lower to middle to lower to middle class family. Uh, I came out to New York with literally zero connections to this industry, and yet somehow. Like, um, you know, both Lloyd and I found a way to, to, to be seen, to find community, to, to like, honestly, like my first Asian friends I ever had that, that, that were super meaningful to me. I met when I was 25 coming to New York and joining the Mai, or, you know, that first invitation to the Mai Lab. Lloyd was one of my first friends in New York uh, that looked like me. Uh, being a kid from Arkansas. And I think that, yes, I started a theater company. I think that, that for me, that was what I did to get seen, to get heard from, because the stuff that I wanted to do um, didn't really fit the mold for any theaters that I had seen. And, but, you know, like, it's always like, if you can see a theater that is doing work that fits you, go work for that theater. But if you, if no one's doing it, if you need to make it on your own, uh, then, then do that too. And I, I wouldn't, I would go, I don't know if it's, you know, like, I don't know if it's bad to, to do that. I think that that is the only way I knew how to create a career was to define it myself. And I think that, uh, again, it's not advice. It's just, that was a path I took. Um, but I've seen many writers take many different paths up. And I think that um, there's more opportunity, you know, there, as, many, as many opportunities that are coming. Um, I think it's always hard when it comes to theater. But uh, I think that if, you, if your story needs to be told, if it's, if it's unique, I, I think it will find a way. Awesome. Um, all right, we'll take one or two more. So what's an artistic challenge you'd like to give yourself and also to give each other, if you want to think of that way too? <laughs> to myself Just and an to Just an easy each one. Other. Just a layup. <laughs> hmm. Lloyd? I mean, interestingly, there was another, all like vamp by asking another question, which sort of is similar and connected to it, because it's another way at it maybe, is how do you show, this is another hard one, how do you show through your writings the morality and community needed in the world today, which is some, somewhat connected, both really large existential questions. I just talked longer, so you had more time to think, but big ones. You can choose you, could you say that one more time? How do you show? How do you show through your writings the morality and community needed in the world today? Which they're not connected, but they're similar big picture. Yeah, 
I mean, I could speak to the the second one. Like uh, the, I think that for me, like what I what I constantly am trying to make, whether it's a vampire cowboy play or one of my Vic Gone plays, uh, is literally like my mission as an artist is to create superheroes or heroes for people who aren't often depicted that way uh, on stage or on screen. That has been my sole purpose, I think, as a writer often, whether it was uh, for LGBTQ characters or women characters who often aren't seen as superheroes or, you know, African-American or people of color, uh, Asians, obviously. Um, and that's always been, you know, I, I don't know if it's a morality, but it is definitely a reflection to the world I would like to see, that more kids get to have a chance to see heroes up there. And when it comes to the community, my, the, the, I, I hope that all my shows have uh, the same kind of diverse, you know, casting and spirit that, that all, you know, all my Vampire Cowboys plays have. Because I feel like the more people you have in the room from different corners of the world, the more aspects that you have, the richer the work can be. And uh, it becomes a thing that like, like it's not just the story or the content I'm telling, but also how I'm telling it and with the people, the, the, the people I'm telling it with, uh, I think is very crucial. I think that uh, that has always been a, a big, important, you know, uh, mission of my own just for myself, uh, whether it's with, it, with Vampire Cowboys or not. Um, so I can speak to that I, I, when it comes to like dares to, within myself. Um, I, I think I'm always daring myself to dig deeper and scarier, to go to scarier places that are uncomfortable uh, and finding funny ways to uh, tell those stories because I, I, I look at life through a very humorous kind of poppy lens. And so I'm always trying to dig into those deeper, more uncomfortable places. Um, when it comes to dares for Lloyd, uh, I dare him to you know, write a play about me. I would love to see my life story depicted by Lloyd Suh, because he would say long talking speeches that would make me sound real smart. That's my beard. Who would, who would play you? Uh, Daniel Day Kim, <laughs> the sexiest Asian man on the planet, <laughs> clearly, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> That or Will Harper. It's always been like, because Will Harper plays all of us at some point, right? Or he has played me. So, you know what? Fuck Daniel Day Kim. I'm going back to Will Harper. He was amazing in Agent G as Queen. So, what about you, Lloyd? I mean, I think yeah, I'll do the same thing and answer the second part first, which is that, um, I mean, I, I don't think that I ever enter into any, like, I, I enter projects. Uh, with a question that I'm wrestling with. So it's it's hard for me to ever have like a destination in mind, like a, or a feeling like I know that the goal is somehow to show um, uh, community or morality um, as, like a, as like a point. But I do think that to that question, um, like it's about what, what, what do the people that you're putting in your plays, what do they, what are they striving for, right? Um, and when I consider what they're striving for, it's, you know, it's always related. Like it, the things that anybody is striving for, the things that, you know, you and I strive for just day to day, living life, navigating the world is, um, is rooted in Community. It's always rooted in community. It's always rooted in um, like a striving for a kind of kindness, a, a, a different kind of kindness than the world currently offers. Um, and so to that, you know, to what that is on the, on the first question, I think that the challenge that I'm currently already engaged in is this one about excavating um, these specific moments in Asian American history so that I can wrestle with them. And so if I have a challenge, like it's, a new challenge to add to that. It's um, it's around oh brother. I mean, <laughs> there's like you know. Like I love I, that. I just watched you lose steam. <laughs> you were going so well, and it just no. fucking crashed and burned. Was that really man, going well? I didn't feel like I was going, going well. well. I mean, I okay, I you were talking, but it didn't feel like it went nowhere. Yeah, it didn't really. Right? <laughs> Didn't really feel like good. Sorry, like, I should have oh, called you out on that. But no, no I mean, I think that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's what happens when you long talk for too long. <laughs> so. I don't know. It's a hard question. It's a hard question. 
I'll have to think about it more. <laughs> I picked the hard one. There were a lot, but you guys, I could go on and on. I could listen to both of you forever. I should wrap up, but I just listening to you definitely, first of all, was the highlight of my week. And also, I just felt really, really lucky that you're both writing um, plays for Atlantic because it's in addition to being extraordinary humans and just smart, smart, kind people, you're really good writers. And I just feel so lucky to have you um, in our stable of writers because you are friends and amazing people. So thank you. I know you have a lot going on. Um, so thank you for taking the time to do this. Um, and also thanks to everyone who joined. It was so nice to have you here. You have a lot of fans um, here through the chat, you guys. So basically, mm -hmm. I just wanted to say, thank everyone that's here. Thank Lloyd and Kui. And um, I think another reminder also just in the chat, if anybody feels so inclined to make a donation to Atlantic, and then I'll flip it over to Claire because I probably forgot something in there. If there's any no. other wrap up. You've forgotten nothing. You are the perfect wrap up. And Lloyd and Quee, I, I echo what Annie said. I was riveted by that whole conversation. And um, thanks so much for welcoming us into your brains. What, what um, magical places to inhabit. <laughs> we feel very lucky. Um, no, yeah. I mean, Annie, you've said it all. Say, you know, these are very strange times and, um, and painful and challenging and um, very unlike what we thought we'd be doing this summer. And I've said it before, but I'll say it again because I think it really matters. You know, we, we're craving being in a room all together again, but for now what we've got is this and each other. And it's actually um, much more intimate than a lot of things um, we've done before. So I just say thank you for letting us sort of listening to you guys share all of your um, amazing stories. Um, and if you all have been moved um, and you uh, are enjoying this programming and want to join us again. We hope that you will more every week, um, Fridays, Live with Atlantic. We've got another Writers Reflect session actually next week with um, Alice Birch and Simon Stevens, um, two Atlantic playwrights and extraordinary writers in their own right as well. Um, and thank you all for joining us and being in community with us. And um, yes to kindness. Keep spreading it. And that's all. Thank you, Kui and Lloyd. Mwah. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Be well. Take care of yourselves and each other. Bye. Thanks so much for joining, everybody. Enjoy your weekend. Bye.